Over the years, so many slow teams have existed. They've come and gone, turning up with bright-eyed dreams of making it to the top of Formula 1 to never actually get there. Underfunded and slow is usually the simple to the point synopsis. But some of these teams did give it a good hard go despite not having access to the same facilities, brains and bank accounts as the likes of McLaren, Williams, Ferrari and Benetton. Minardi is probably the best example. LaRue's is another that managed to last a fair few years, while some like Onyx, Forty and others had things go so badly wrong for them, they ended up signing business deals with partners who weren't exactly the most model citizens in the world. I mean, LaRue's can be put into that latter group as well. But then you'd get a team that turned up that was just outright deluded. A team that turned up with a new engine construction for 1990 in what was basically a massive advert for said engine, only for it to go nowhere. That team was the Life Team, and their car became known for setting the slowest qualifying lap in Formula 1 history. So a quick history, because OGs to the channel have already heard it a million times before with remakes and the original video, but in 1989 turbos were dead and everybody was back on naturally aspirated 3.5 litre, 8, 10 or 12 cylinder engines. Some tried a flat 12 configuration, but a man called Ernesto Vita had acquired a W12 instead. The W12 is 3 banks of 4 instead of 2 banks of 6, so it looks like a W as opposed to a V. And while it's taller than a V12, it's shorter, so in theory it should produce the same power while reducing the centre of gravity. The problem was, none of the big teams, to the shock of literally nobody, wanted anything to do with this untested engine being thrust upon them by a silver-tongued Italian who had no racing experience. So, this Italian, a man called Ernesto Vita, set up his own team to advertise this new wonder engine to the world, because Vita had bought the rights to this engine and needed to make his money back. So the team had shown up to the United States Grand Prix in 1990 with a chassis that was built by the stillborn first F1 team in 1989 and had a bit of a checkered past in it, in that it was a death trap, and it also came with a bunch of spare parts and four of these W12 engines. The engine was over 200 horsepower down on the McLarens and the Ferraris and by far the heaviest. A Lotus 49 had more power and because it handled like a brick it was going to be outclassed by a Formula 3 car. The man who'd initially been put in the driver's seat was Gary Brabham, son of Jack Brabham and brother of Jeff and David, who quickly realised that this was not going to be a fun time. Brabham claimed they didn't have a tyre pressure gauge and that the car's tachometer didn't work and other bits and pieces. One of those bits being the car breaking down after less than 400 yards and pieces like the team only having 9 people at most. So after the 1990 Brazilian Grand Prix, Brabham quit, but life still had a couple of weeks to get a replacement. And they got one, in Bruno Giacomelli, the only person who said yes to driving for them. Everybody else told them to, well, politely go away. He'd been promised a decent payday, 30 grand a race, and wanted to see if this W12 thing could actually work, since Bruno was technically minded and Vita was telling him that there was big funding coming for the team that I guess I'll have to expand more upon a little bit later. But anyway, Giacomelli was in the car for the race at Imola, which although it was the San Marino Grand Prix, it was a home Grand Prix for the team, as the base was in Formagini, which is only just up the road from Ferrari's place. You know that bit when Top Gear did the 24-hour endurance race at Silverstone, and they said, the other teams turned up with motorhomes coming in sponsors that had girls in them, and then it cuts to their van with the crisp packets and lads mags all on the floor, and they say, ours wasn't like that. That's how I imagine this operation being. So, time for another recap. This recap is the qualifying rules for this time period. Because only 26 cars could be on the grid and more than 26 entries were on the list, the worst performing cars had to go into a Friday morning session called pre-qualifying. At this point in the season, it was the bottom ranked cars from the end of the 1989 season, plus the live team because they were a new team on the grid. So the drivers who had to get up early, and I mean it was early, sort of, the session started at 8am, were Gabrielli Tarquini and Yannick Damas in the AGS cars, Bertrand Gachot in the Coloni, Claudio Langes and Roberto Moreno in the Eurobruns, Eric Bernardo Naguri Suzuki in the Lolas, Giacomeni's Life and Olivier Gruyard's Acela. There had been some other driver movements prior to the start of the Grand Prix as well. Gregor Foytek had left Brabham to join Onyx since his dad part owned the team, and David Brabham joined Brabham. You see, Lance and Lawrence aren't the first to do this, you know. Although Jack didn't own the Brabham team at this point, it was the Middlebridge group. Also, David is getting a lot of airtime lately. This is the third time in as many videos. So how it worked was, these nine drivers had to slug it out while everybody else was at breakfast, and the top four made it into the afternoon qualifying session where 30 drivers would be whittled down to 26, 
which is the FIA's hard cap on drivers starting a Grand Prix. The AGS cars had to withdraw from the session. Dalmas was still nursing a hand injury from testing and the other had to withdraw due to fuel pressure issues. But while everybody was certain the Lolas would be the top cars, they also wanted to look at how slow this life car was going to be this time around. At Phoenix, which was more of a chassis track, it had been 35 seconds away from getting out of pre-qualifying. In Brazil, it hadn't set a lap at all due to the car breaking down in comical fashion before reaching the end of the pit lane. Information is hard to come by in terms of the order in which the lap times were set, but either way on this occasion, Giacomelli was actually on track and was about to set a lap. But as he came out of the final couple of corners, the chicane that ended the older layout of the Imola circuit, something on the car broke, with all reports pointing to a drive belt that ended up spraying coolant all over the track. On top of this, for the entirety of his lap, Giacomelli was not able to get out of fourth gear. Now unbelievably, Giacomelli is down a setting a lap time, that time being a 7 minute 16.212. Again, searching the internet for a few hours hasn't really brought any concrete facts here, so I can only assume that Giacomelli brought the car back to the pits, and in doing so, broke the timing being to log that lap, because he must have continued all the way down to the end of the pit lane. I say this because if you remember, Senna got fastest slap at Donington in 1993 through taking that little shortcut on his way to an abandoned pit stop. But let's be honest, no driver in his right mind would finish that lap in the proper manner. But I don't know why Giacomelli is down as not setting a lap time at all unless they were trying to embarrass the live team out of competing any further. But it actually looks like Giacomelli had been one of the first drivers on track because by 10 past 8 that Friday morning, that life car did not take to the track for the rest of the day. For Giacomelli to have lapped that slowly, he would have been maintaining an average speed of about 26 miles an hour over the 3.1 mile circuit that Imola had at this time. He must have been clutch kicking the hell out of that thing to keep the revs up to get up the hill coming out of Toza and back up the hill again after Aqua Minerale, as well as getting out of any slow speed corners. So, somewhat disappointingly, the lap was set because there was a serious problem with the car, rather than the fact the car was legitimately that slow. But still, you could go on board with Stefan Beloff for a lap of the Nürburgring in the time it took Giacomelli to do that lap. I can't say that with a straight face. And still have time to spare. On a lap that's five times longer as well. <laughs> the car was so bad. For the rest of the pre-qualifiers, Bernard, Suzuki, Gruyard, and Moreno made it to the top 30 and all four started the Grand Prix. Senna would start on pole, but he retired with wheel issues on lap 3, which makes it sound like he couldn't wheel, but this left Patrese to take the win ahead of Berger and Alessandro Nannini. It never got any better for life after this. They never qualified for a single race and Giacomelli never got his payday. The funding that was promised was coming from a company called PIC, an oil company based in St. Petersburg, Russia, but the Soviet Union was on the brink of total collapse and the money, which was estimated to be in the region of 20 million US dollars, never made it from the east to Italy. It was this business deal that resulted in the Soviet flag being put on the car. They did get some money from PIC, however, enough to buy a single Judd V8 that they bought off Leighton House that they used for their final two outings in Estoril and Hireth an engine that when they received it, had been seized solid, probably as some prank. Their performances were so bad that Bernie himself tried to convince them to go home to avoid any more embarrassment, but Vita said no. Vita being a man who was described as being someone who could sell ice to the Inuit, a man who appeared out of nowhere in 1988 and disappeared back into the unknown in 1991. Gary Brabham once said, he was volatile and had a temper. When the team sat down with him to tell him I didn't have sponsorship, I was waiting outside and he cracked the shits and tipped a table over. The Volkswagen Group has managed to make W12s and other W engines work, but this required a lot of money that life didn't have. And although its designer, Franco Rocci, was a famed engine designer for Ferrari, he'd made one catastrophic oversight with his new engine. The no laps at Brazil were once thought to have been the result of mechanics not bothering to put oil in the car, but it later turned out, nearly 20 years later at Goodwood, that they found out the problem. The engine was eating itself alive because of a hole drilled in the engine to allow more oil to get into the daughter rod. With time and money, the engine could have produced the power needed. Later on, 30 horsepower was found from one cylinder bank, but it would have needed a lot of time and money and nobody knows how much of either it would have needed, and the other teams would have just stuck with V10s, V12s and V8s anyway because they worked. 
But the engine did get the last laugh at Goodwood when it ran along with the championship winning McLaren, and the McLaren broke down while the life car made it up the hill. Okay, I say it had the last laugh, more of a wry smile. But life would be forgotten a couple of years later, when a shoe salesman from Italy would try to achieve F1 success. So then, a look at the slowest lap in F1 history. If this has been a worthwhile extension of a storytime classic, then do like the video so I know I've taught you something new, and for more stuff like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Big up to the Patreon massive for the support, and if you want to help out with things around here, then there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord and to my socials, as well as the F1 store affiliate link if you want to buy yourself some F1 stuff for the rest of the season. Or the super thanks if you just want to buy me a nice cold beer, because I could do with one. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mord, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.